totally booked. Rock and roll! Well, I think I'll leave you to your reading. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. Rock and roll on! We are totally booked. Welcome back to the Booked on Rock podcast. I'm Eric Senich. Subscribe and give the podcast a five-star review wherever you listen. The website, bookedonrock.com. Author Greg Prado is our guest. He is back on the podcast to talk about his latest book, Iconic Guitar Gear. Renowned guitarists or experts discussing tools of the trade in their own words serves as the basis of Iconic Guitar Gear. Jimi Hendrix, Eddie Van Halen, Randy Rhodes, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Brian May, Tony Iommi, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, Kurt Cobain, The Edge, Alex Lifeson, Stevie Vai, Dimebag Daryl, Zach Wild. The list goes on, and it won't let you down. If you've ever pondered what some of rock's top guitarists and bassists favor gear-wise, whether it's instruments, amps, and or effects, then Iconic Guitar Gear is most certainly the book for you. Greg Prado is a writer and journalist from Long Island, New York, whose writing has appeared in such renowned publications as Rolling Stone, Classic Rock, and Vintage Guitar. He's also the author of several popular books, including Grunge is Dead, The Oral History of Seattle Rock Music, MTV Ruled the World, The Early Years of Music Video, and A Devil on One Shoulder and An Angel on the Other, the story of Shannon Hoon and Blind Melon. The follow-up, just recently released, titled Shannon. He's made appearances on several TV, radio, and podcast appearances, including the Howard Stern Wrap-Up Show and Eddie Trunk Live. He's been a guest on the Booked on Rock podcast and my previous podcast, Discovery. Always love talking music with Greg. To hear a playlist of the guitarists we talk about in this episode, head over to the show notes page. Greg, welcome back to the podcast. Great to have you on again. Hey, Eric. Thanks for having me back. So this is your second appearance on this podcast, and I think I had you on, what, twice on the previous one, Discovery. So you are in the Hall of Fame here, man, I'm telling you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it was the first one was for the Shredders book, and the other one was about Shannon Noon and Blind Melon, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you were back on one of the very first episodes on this podcast was for the John Bonham book and All right. the Bon Scott book. Right, there you go. So this is cool. So this book is just outstanding. This is a journey through all of the interviews you've done with guitarists dating back to the 90s. It's an incredible compilation. We're talking, what, almost 275 different guitarists? Does that sound right? Something like that. Yeah. I mean, I actually lost track because, yeah, because like you just said in this book, which is called Iconic Guitar Gear, um, I dug up a lot of my past interviews where guitarists, I uh, talked about their gear, but then also I did a bunch of brand new interviews for the book as well. Like I interviewed Kim, Kim Thile from Soundgarden was a brand new interview. Steve Vai was kind enough to do a, a pretty long interview, which he talked about all his, you know, major, the, the, the major instruments he's played and uh, a bunch of other people too. So, and then also like, of course, sadly, I could not interview Eddie Van Halen. So I interviewed Brad Tolinsky, who wrote the uh, great Van Halen book. I believe it's called Eruption that came out of a, about like one year ago. Oh yeah, man. That's a great, with Chris Gill. Yeah, that is just an outstanding book. And we're also going to post the comments that Brad gave to you that you had in the book that you also put up on allmusic.com. And we're going to put that up on the Van Halen news desk. But yeah, it would have been great to be able to talk to Eddie. But man, you talked to plenty of guitars for this book. And it is in your style with all of your books. It's the Q&A approach which I love because it's the artist telling the story. You set it up a little bit, but you let the artist tell the story. Is that basically how you wanted to approach writing books from the start? Yeah, that you know, because before I was even a writer, I found that the stuff that I enjoyed reading the most were straight Q and A's. I never really liked books where it's the author guessing at what happened and putting words in people's mouths. I really like when the information is coming straight straight from the source. So for this book. We go through each guitarist, A through Z, and I put in a little uh, intro paragraph just to give a little bit of background for each artist. And then from there, we just list uh, the guitars that they discussed and sometimes also amplifiers and also uh, effects as well. So, yeah, it's um, it, would, it definitely took work, uh, you know, just putting everything in order and you're editing things. So it kind of made sense. But uh, I think it's something that uh, most guitar players will enjoy. It's uh Definitely a good book, I would think, if you're if you're sitting on the toilet, right? Yeah, well, I was going to say it's also entertaining for those of us who aren't guitarists, just because I'm always fascinated with how these how these guys 
do what they do, what they're thinking and the process they go through, because that's, I think maybe that's why I'm such a music fan, because I could never do what they do. And that's what just makes them seem almost larger than life to me. Right. Yeah. And then also, like I mentioned before, I had Brad uh, Talensky talking about uh, Eddie Van Halen, and he talked a little bit about how he came up with his uh, famous stripe design on his uh, Frankenstrat. So we talked a little bit about that, like what his theories are about how he came up with that really cool iconic design. So there's, you know, straight guitar talk, but there's also stuff in there that you don't have to be a super guitar nerd to appreciate some of the cool little things that we talk about, like also Ace Frehley talking about how he came up with his smoking guitar and also all other things as well. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about both those guys, Ace and Brad Talinsky's comments and, and some more stuff. I see guitars in the background there, so you play a little guitar yourself? I do play a little bit of guitar, and for the past few years, I haven't done it in about, in about a year or so, but for the two years prior to this year, I was fooling around with um, a, a very popular software bit called uh, GarageBand, and I was uh, just recording like, little like instrumental bits and stuff like that, trying to cover as many different styles of music as possible. Some shredding stuff, but then I also did some original things that sounded like Yacht Rock, some things that sounded like Soundgarden, some things that were jazzy. I tried to do a, a pretty wide variety of things, just strictly for my own personal uh, fun. Just but, having yeah, some fun, yeah. Is it endless exactly tracks on uh, on that garage band? Is it endless tracks that you can put in there? Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, like it, They have... What you do is you just pick some like bullshit drum loop that, that you pick, and then you could just add the bass and guitar uh, to that. You know, so it's kind of like you start with the drums and you just add everything else on top of it. So cool, man. Think about the musicians back from the 40s, 50s, 60s, even the 70s and 80s and 90s, yeah. too. It's like, man, if I could do that when I was a kid, that would have been cool. But, you know, I was going to say, I would have absolutely loved to have something like that when I was a teenager, just learning how to play guitar. That would have been great. Oh, yeah. As far as this book, any surprising comments that stand out for you from these interviews, something you never expected to hear? There's definitely some interesting things. Like we have Michael Angelo Batillo talking about how he came up with his quad guitar. That's always kind of a, a funny thing that it had to do a little bit with Steve Vai playing a double neck in the Just Like Paradise video and that um, he didn't particularly like that Steve Vai was supposedly, uh, you know, kind of biting on his style a little bit. So he decided to up the ante and went for four necks, hence the good old quad guitar. Yeah. I, I love and Just then, Like Paradise. I know Stevie didn't like that song that much. Not that he hated it, but it wasn't something he was into. You know, I kind of fooled myself into liking the Skyscraper album when it came out. But now that I listen to Eat em and Smile and Skyscraper, there's absolutely no comparison between those two albums. I think Eat em and Smile is one of my all-time favorite albums. And it's a uh, complete shame that that lineup didn't stay together longer and also continued in that uh, style of music. Because for Skyscraper... Billy Sheen's told me over the years how he was told what to play and it was uh, more like a little bit dancey and it was definitely more like, uh, you know, it was like more like synths and stuff like that. It definitely was not as raw and rocking as Eat Him and Smile. And uh, yeah, that to me is a, uh, that that was a big, that was a big fumble of the ball. In yeah, my Eat Him and Smile sounds more, it's more of a timeless album. You listen to that now yes. and it's still so good. You listen to Skyscraper, a song like Stand Up. That hasn't yeah. stood up over the years as well. Yeah. I, I, You're right. <laughs> sorry, that was a cheap joke. Right. Cheap joke, but um, <laughs> I love. I remember liking that song as a kid, and now when you hear it, you're like, yeah, that's very eighties, very eighties. Right. Part. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and also like just uh, some other things. I interviewed uh, Brad, Brad uh, Gillis, who we all know from the Speak of the Devil Ozzy album. Yes. He talks about how he came up. He pretty much created his own you know that that red strat that he's played throughout the years he talks about that how he painted it and he did like all different things to it and uh he had he made it a point to buy one of the original floyd rose tremlos i believe he said only two other people before had the tremlos that was eddie van halen and also neil uh, sean and he was the third one to get one of the very first original floyd roses yeah he loves so that, that doing was, those the the dive bombs and the Yes, yeah, he does that little Thanks. cricket chirp thing he came up with. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's, yeah. let's go to the 90s. You start off with comments from Pearl Jam bassist Jeff Ameth, and he talks about his use of the Hamer 12 string on Pearl Jam's Jeremy, and that is him yeah. you hear in the beginning of the song, and without it. Yeah. You know, what is that song without that? I wonder if they even tried to record it without that because it wouldn't have sounded the same. Exactly. Yeah, because I know that Jeff has told me over the years that he was inspired by Tom Peterson of Cheap Trick and also Doug Pinnock from the band King's X. They both used the 8-string and, and also 12-string, uh, but Jeff was playing just, just the 12. I know the other two 
guitars have used eight and also 12. But uh, yeah, without that 12 string bass, which was a, a Hamer, which he talks about, yeah, that uh, Jeremy wouldn't, it would sound totally different. It, would, it, it wouldn't sound probably as different from all the other songs on that album either. Because to the best of my knowledge, I think that's the only album on Pearl Jam 10 where he's using the 12 string. I don't think he uses it again on anything else. Right. I think you're right. I don't think he uses yeah. it again. And it's just instant as soon as you hear it instant when you hear it in concert too jeff beck has one of the coolest tones in rock history you include comments from beck expert wolf marshall jeff has experimented so much throughout his career so it's no surprise that he hasn't stuck to one gear setup and wolf really went into depth on jeff's choice of guitars and amps that guy is a serious jeff beck expert huh he is yeah yeah back back in the 80s and 90s you know that wolf marshall did a lot of books uh, he did a book on Tony Iommi, Gary Moore, where he just pretty much analyzed their whole entire technique and also style. I, I don't know if he ever did a book about Eddie. I don't think he ever has. But yeah, but I know that he is a huge, huge uh, Beck fan and he knows everything about him. So it was uh, great to speak to him about Jeff Beck and also Stevie Ray Vaughan. I interviewed him about it. He had some great things to also say about Stevie Ray Vaughan. But uh, yeah, with um, Jeff Beck, uh, I, I know Wolf tells a pretty cool story, which I didn't know that. Um, in the book, there's a photo of Jeff playing a Telecaster. It has two humbuckers, which I believe are two Seymour Duncan uh, pickups. And what happened was he traded Seymour Duncan. Uh, Seymour Duncan traded him that guitar. And the guitar that Jeff gave Seymour Duncan was the original Yardbirds Telecaster. And, he, and Jeff Beck was like, yeah, sure, I'll trade you. And then when, he, when Seymour Duncan was walking out the door holding that guitar, he said to himself, like, Holy shit, what did I just do? I just gave away the fucking Yardbirds guitar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What what era of Beck do you like most? I love the early 2000s. Um, that might be an unpopular choice, but I love what he started doing in that early 2000s era with the electronic beats and stuff. Yeah, I'd say my favorite is uh, Beck Bogart, Apathy, Blow by Blow. And I'd say by, by far my favorite Beck album is the album Wired from 1976. Yes. I actually love that album. Classic. Yep. That's my favorite. Adrian Ballou, who's worked with Zappa, David Bowie, King Crimson, Talking Heads, which I didn't realize. You rank him high on your list of favorite guitarists. I would put him in, I put him in possibly, well, I guess we're going to get to this in a little bit, but he's in possibly my top five favorite guitarists. He's either fifth or sixth. I'm not sure, but, but yeah, but he also tells a a pretty cool story about um, back in the 80s, you would see him playing these, this, well, I think he may still, uh, I don't know if he still plays it, but. He, he still played it up to about maybe 10 or 20 years ago. It was a Strat that was relic. It was one of the first relic type Strats. And he talks about how he um, took a brand new Strat and he set it on fire. He whacked it with a screwdriver. He dragged it through his backyard. And uh, it definitely looks like that after you see what that, yeah. what that, what that, what that, what that Strat looks like. But uh, he talks about the guitars he used with King Crimson. Because my favorite uh, stuff I think, that he's ever done or the early 80s uh, Crimson albums, like um, uh, the albums um, We Have a Perfect Pair, Beat, and also, of course, Discipline is my favorite. But that's probably, that, that has to be one of my favorite Prague-type albums of all time, uh, the uh, 1981 Discipline album. So let's get to who are your top five favorite guitarists. Okay. This is well, I have I, I put down five, but I, there's the, the number five, it's, it's either between two people. I'll start with number one, Jimi Hendrix. Because you think of what guitar was like before he came along, and there's absolutely no comparison to what guitar was like before that, and him being bold enough to use feedback and distortion and everything and using the tremolo bar the way he did. So uh, I think he has to be number one. Number two has to be, of course, the person that we love so much, Eddie Van Halen. Yes. Because um, also he's num- he's the second person you could say that he totally shifted the direction of you know guitar, guitar. It was kind of, I wouldn't say getting boring because he did have that great, you know, th- th- those those great Beck albums like right around that time. But it was um, maybe getting a little predictable, maybe guitar at that point or nothing new was really grabbing people. You know, so what he did was just great. And uh, the thing that makes him so great, um, some people just tend to focus on his speed aspect. But the thing that always I loved the most about Eddie was his rhythm playing was phenomenal. And of course, the most important thing was the quality of his uh, songwriting. Yeah, isn't that so true? And I think more so since his passing, I've read and heard so many people talk about his rhythm and guitar playing. Yeah. Which I don't exactly. recall hearing that much about it 
during his lifetime. And now people are starting to realize that he could, he was so versatile. He wasn't just the right. guy that can play a million notes. He could do so much more than that. And we know he could write music. And that was exactly the key. Because uh, something I'm going to talk about later when I talk about my favorite solos is the intro to the song um, Mean Streets. I mean, some people would listen to that and think that it's a solo, but it's really just like a rhythm, almost like percussive thing he's doing. So that's not even really a solo. That to me is more like a really cool, like, thing that he's just, you know, again, he's not, I don't think it's showing off. It's more like trying new approaches with the guitar. That's and it. I think that's what, you know, he, made him really stand out from everybody else was he wasn't just a speed demon. He was at the peak of his powers in that album. Exactly. Peak of his powers with experimenting and, and everything else that he did on that album is just timeless. How about I agree. the rest of the list? So we've got, that's one and two. Which I, which I agree with, by the way, because Hendrix, you have to put one. He's, yeah. Without him, where, where are the rest of the guitars? So you got to do right. that. Yep. Right, exactly. And then number three, I have Queen's Brian May, who I think is also phenomenal with his whole uh, guitar army thing they used to call because he would stack guitars and build guitar kind of symphony orchestra type things, which I think is phenomenal. Um, there's on the Live Killers album, the live version of the song Brighton Rock. Absolutely fantastic solo because... You think about it, usually when a guitarist uh, does a guitar, a unaccompanied solo live, it just puts people to sleep. But uh, what he does on that, it's like a whole other song that he's playing. So I think it definitely, you know, it, it definitely keeps it would definitely keep the average person's um, attention if they were at the show seeing that. Number four, and it seen, and so those are clearly my top three. Then after that, it gets a little blurry. Like I could name you like 100 guitarists, but I have I kind of try to just like bring it down to a few. Um, Tony Iommi from the band Black Sabbath. Of course, he's not the fastest soloist, but just the amount of guitar riffs that he came up with, his rhythms, uh, the tone, him being one of the first heavy metal guitarists to also tune, tune down to D. Um, yeah, I think that he definitely deserves to be in that top five. Huge influence on the 90s guys like Kim Thione. Absolutely. Those guys, yep. Yep, absolutely. The number five, I, I put two people because it's hard for me to decide. I just want to have Ace Freely, and I also have a gentleman we just talked about before, Adrian Ballou. Okay. I went with Ace because um, he's similar to also Tony Iommi and also, excuse me, like similar to Brian May and also people like, well, yeah, I, I guess actually Brian, Brian May is the best example of this, that they play a solo and you can actually sing along to the solo because it's complete. it's a complete like melody. Pretty much, and there's a lot of Ace Frehley songs you could just sing along to. It's kind of like a song within a song sort of thing. Um, Elliot Easton from the band The um, Cars was also like that as well. That the solos were like a constructed song within the song. Although I don't think Ace Frehley really constructed his solos, but it just so happens that what he would play was very melodic and kind of like sing songy at, at, at yep. points. Elliot Easton. Then, somebody uh, yeah. somebody mentioned him one time to me, and I just thought Elliot Easton, a great guitarist. And then I listened to his yeah. stuff, and it's like, oh, yeah, he is good. Yeah, well, I'd say one of my favorite solos of his, of, I'm talking about uh, Elliot Easton now, is a song called Candio on their yes. second album. That's a that's a fantastic solo. Yep, absolutely. As far as Baloo, I mean, uh, I don't think there's any other guitarist that really, like, that really truly sounds like him. He's completely original, and just his use of noise and odd notes and everything, and very interesting rhythms, and... Just also his sound can alternate between clean, distorted, like really fuzzy distortion. He's always a very, a very intriguing and also very, very like uncommon sounding guitarist. So I felt like I had to put him in there someplace. What about Angus? Would you have Angus in the top Angus 10? Angus I absolutely love. Yeah, you know, Angus I love. You know, honestly, though, for me with ACDC, the thing that over the years that now that I love so much about ACDC, I think, is the vocals of Bon Scott. That's the thing. I mean, when I was younger, I know I focused a lot more probably on Angus, but now as I'm older, I realize what uh, amazing talent and just what a great singer he was that you hear a second of Bon Scott singing and you know exactly who it is. No one sounded like him. It was a very, very original singing style. So, yeah, yeah no, but definitely I love Angus. Oh, yeah, but then yeah, if we're going to talk about Angus, I mean, really, Malcolm Young was probably equal, although, of course, Angus got all the press coverage and photos, but I mean... Malcolm. Malcolm Young was probably the greatest rhythm guitarist ever as far as rock and just all the riffs he co-wrote or wrote. Driving Force. Just, yeah. Exactly. Driving Force is a good explanation. I just talked to Susan Messino, who wrote some great books on ACDC, and that episode will be just before yours goes up. So Susan wrote oh, cool. some great books. 
How about five most yeah, underrated definitely. guitarists? That's a tough okay, one. Okay, the five more, five most underrated. Number one, James Honeyman Scott from the band The uh, Pretenders. Okay. The song "Tattooed Love Boys" is one of my favorite one of my favorite solos ever, and uh, no one ever really ever seems to talk about it, or even you know, like when people talk about the great guitar solos, it's a very it, it's like a very original solo that it's like he's giving you kind of short little like phrases. He'll do a phrase stop, phrase stop, phrase stop, and it goes on for pre- it's like almost ten phrases that he does, and it's uh, very memorable. And again, it's like one of those things that you could almost like sing every single little phrase that he's doing. So uh, he, I thought, was a great guitarist who, of course, tragically died, you know, far, far too young. So who knows what he could have gone on to do? You know, so that's kind of the whole tragic aspect. I'll put him out. We'll make a playlist for each episode. So put that in the playlist, that song. Yes, I was. I would highly recommend Tattooed Love Boys. Okay. Then number two, a guitarist that no one ever speaks about. And while he's not a great soloist, his rhythm work, I think, was original and fantastic. Ricky Wilson from the band, the B-52s. Okay. These are good picks. If you listen, yes. If you listen to the song, uh, Pri- uh, Private Idaho, yep. um, his, r- his rhythm work, it's almost like surf, but it's also like late night B movie sixties soundtrack type stuff. You can't, it's hard to even explain what, like how he comes up with this thing. Similar to his style. And I think about it, who I'm also a fan of is the guitarist East Bay Ray from the band, the, um, dead kennedys they have a kind of a similar surfy rockabilly ish style but really in both cases it's the, it's the quality of the riffs i think that really uh, make those two guitars shine so yeah so i'll give uh, props to uh, the late great ricky wilson who passed away i believe in 85 or 86. we're gonna have tommy bolin because the song quadrant four off of billy cobham spectrum is uh that to me i often point to as um that is for me, it serves as the bridge between what Jimi Hendrix was doing and then also what later Eddie Van Halen is going to be doing, where it's um, wild guitar. He's doing wild dive bomb whammy things, which to the I mean, Jimi Hendrix did do that a bit. But what Tommy Boland's doing on that song is much more similar to what I think Eddie Van Halen is going to do in uh, come 1978. So that's kind of the bridge right there. You could say Tommy Boland's the bridge. And then and then also I just love Tommy Boland's work with. The James Gang, Deep Purple, he did a very cool album called Come Taste the Band that no one really ever gives props to. And he put out two great soul albums as Isn't well. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, he had those little short, brief moments throughout his career that you forget, like you say. Deep Purple and he James did. And, I, and, then I, and, I, and I just realized Tommy Boland passed away at a young age, too. So my yeah. first three picks are guitarists that passed away. And also, I just remembered one of my first books was about Tommy Boland. It was called Touched by Magic, the Tommy Boland Story, because... Sadly, the way he died is it's tragic, and there's still a lot of questions about how he died. There's some theories that it was a setup, that people were trying to collect life insurance policy on him and everything like that. So if you want to read an uh, interesting but also uh, also tragic story about a very talented guitarist, check right. out the Touched by Magic book. About was was he 27? I'm looking up quick. Oh, he was 25. I think he was younger. I think he was only 25, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, d- yeah died December was, 4th of 1976. He, he was on tour at the time with also Jeff Beck. Jeff Beck was touring Wired at the time. Uh, and also Jeff Beck points to Tommy Bolin as an influence because uh, he, uh, Jeff Beck loved the Spectrum album, which Tommy Bolin plays so great on. And that kind of inspired him to uh, kind of follow the whole jazz, jazz fusion direction. If people don't know the name Tommy Bolin, if you know Motley Crue, they covered Teaser. Teaser. Which is Teaser. a Tommy Bolin song, right? That's him. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You got it. Then number four, I have another guitarist who um, I think his uh, his riffs are fantastic is uh, Jim Martin from the band Faith No More. I love his uh, rhythm work on those on those Faith No More albums. And if you think about the song Epic, most people think about just the rapping and the, the chorus. But uh, he, I think, does a great solo. Again, one of those solos that you could sing along, you know, with the whole melody. But it's really just the heaviness of his riffs. Uh, my favorite Faith No More album is the album called uh, Angel Dust. And there's a song in there called, uh, the song is called Jizzlobber, which is one of the heaviest <laughs> songs I've probably ever heard, just as far as the riffing. It's like Slayer slowed down, but it's very, very brutal riffing. He, 
Uh, someone want, I remember this is like a long time ago before I, before I even became a writer. I was reading a article about Faith No More, maybe in like a RIP magazine. And they described uh, Jim Martin's rhythm style as high cholesterol riffing. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> which, yeah, which I, which, which I was a huge fan of. Because if you listen to what he's playing in like Surprised You're Dead or the song called Jizz Lobber, it's uh, very, very heavy. What a title, Jizz Lobber. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you the one song I know from that album I love, which is Midlife Crisis. If you, if you're not familiar with that album, you should definitely give that a listen. That's in probably that's in my top five favorite albums of all time. Yeah, I'm I'm ashamed to say I didn't because I love Midlife Crisis and I never invested in the rest of that album. They released quite a few singles from it. But that yeah, you should. Great. It's uh, but I'm I'm just going to warn you. It's one of those albums that the first time the first time you listen to it, it's not going to make sense. But then once you hear it a few more times. It's going to totally, uh, it's it's going to totally hit. Which similar to what we discussed in the past regarding Blind Melon Soup, right? Yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, spe- and, and speaking of Blind Melon, my number five is Roger Stevens, also Christopher Thorne of the band Blind Melon. Oh, nice. You got yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So you got those yeah, cause, um, tied yeah, cause, for I mean, five. Again, yeah, because uh, what those guys do, uh, I can't think of any other guitarists. I mean, maybe like the Allman Brothers, where. It's two guitarists playing. They're like weaving in and out together, but they're not stepping on each other's feet. And um, they could do like a wide variety of styles and, you know, they could solo. But for me, it's really the rhythm work of what's going on. I, I can't think really of any other guitar, any guitar duos in the 90s at the time that were doing what, what, what they were doing with that kind of jazzy, jammy thing. But not jammy that like bores you. It was It was succinct songwriting. Live, they would maybe stretch out a little bit more, but... On record, it was never uh, like this. It, it wasn't like a jam band that just goes on and on, and just puts you to sleep. And still, you put a second book out on Blind Melon Shannon Hoon. The second book yes. came out right recently, and I'd love to. Yes, have- it came out. It came out last year, just simply titled Shannon, which I interviewed. I did a roundtable interview with Rogers and also Christopher, and they talk about um, all the instruments that they use in all the Blind Melon albums. And uh, Rogers tells a good story, which I actually um, put, I actually stuck in this book, Iconic Guitar Gear, because it was such a good story that the yellowish guitar that he's playing in the uh, No Rain video, I remember that first tour, whenever I saw them, I saw them like five times on that tour. Every single time, that was the only guitar he was playing. And then after that tour, I never saw him play it again. And I asked him, like, what exactly happened to that guitar? And he said, uh, in the summer of 1994, Blind Melon was playing. He thinks it was the Reading Festival over in England. And uh, the guitar jack cut out. Something happened. So he got frustrated and just took the guitar off and just kind of tossed it to the side. But, you know, tossed to the side thinking that he'll just pick it up at the end of the show and, you know, it'll it'll get fixed. What happened was he tossed it to the side. Shannon Hoon saw him toss it. And he was under the false impression that it was time to smash guitars. So Shannon Hoon runs over, grabs the guitar and smashes it into two pieces, <laughs> throws it out into the audience. And that's the last he's ever seen that guitar. <laughs> what was it? What are you doing? Exactly. That's what he said. What the hell did you just do? Is what he said. <laughs> but, by the way, the two books, Devil on One Shoulder and An Angel on the Other, the story of Shannon Hoon and Blind Melon. The second one, simply titled Shannon. Is that first book still your bestseller? Because I remember you said that. Yes, it is. Isn't that, that I, I'd cool. say my top... Yeah, my, my top two bestsellers, funny enough, were some of my early books, which is A Devil on One Shoulder, which is about Shannon and Blind Melon, and then Grunge is Dead is another top seller of mine. What about that the t- Take It Off Kiss well. book? That had to have done well. The Kiss- yeah, I, I actually put out two Kiss. I, I did a book called The Eric Carr Story, which is pretty popular. But then more recently, I did a book called Take It Off, which is about uh, Kiss is Not Makeup, a period, which admittedly, I really am just a 70s original lineup Kiss guy. But there's no denying that the non-makeup era did have its, uh, you know, pretty good points. And also it did keep Kiss alive because Kiss was totally dying before they took off their makeup. I mean, the Creatures of the Night album, I am a huge fan of. It's probably in my top five Kiss albums, although I I am, like I said, really just primarily, if I'm going to listen to a Kiss album, it's going to be either anything from the 70s. It's primarily stuff from the 70s. But the Creatures of the Night album is a gloriously heavy Kiss album. But even though that was a great album, that album bombed at the time in 1982. Kiss was uh, considered dead, and they had they pretty much had no choice. That they had to take the makeup off, and by doing so, they were able to success, successfully resuscitate their career. Yep. And people should check out. There's a recent episode of Three Sides of the Coin, the Kiss podcast, which you've been on, 
and they were yes actually they, yes i am actually on that uh I, I am on that episode oh yeah that's right yeah that's right yes, it was for that where book I, where, I, where, yeah. I, where i talk about the top five underrated kiss songs of all time yes we talk about um you know because what it is i wrote recently an article for the all music site where i picked the top five underrated kiss songs and i talked about each and then the gentleman on the three sides of the coin podcast had me on about maybe a month ago and we talked about that as well as several other things. And we also talked about the iconic guitar gear book as well. Yeah, I can't, I, I can't believe I, I was just thinking about one that you were on before to talk about Take It Off. But you're right, because yes. actually when you, you emailed me, literally when I'm reading it, I was listening to you on that episode. Okay. <laughs> of the um, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so that was the second time. Yeah, I was on it when the Take It Off book first came out in 2019. And they had me on again about a month ago. So but you, people should listen to a recent one. They had the guy on who... When he was a teenager in St. Louis, oh Kiss, right, yeah, the, the KS, KSHE festival or something like that. Yeah, the kite flying event. Oh and, yeah, kite, yeah, kite. And, that and Kiss, yeah, Kiss was just nobody knew who the hell they were. They just came right. out the first album. <laughs> but yeah, he, yeah, he, I have to. He, yeah, you know, yeah, I was yesterday. I was surfing through YouTube and I saw that as a new video, and I've been meaning to listen to oh, it. Oh, it's fun. And yeah. he, the guy said, "Man, he's like the the band was tight. Yeah, the band was legit, and that was the only thing I could think of that's similar is." Um, like, like you said, you had me on before talking about the book I did about uh, Bon Scott, which is called A Rock and Rollin' Man. And the only thing I could think of that's similar to that is I interviewed David Ellison, formerly of the band called um, Megadeth. And he talks about going to see Cheap Trick in an arena, I believe, in Minnesota. And uh, he bought tickets. Him and his friends go there, and, they'll, and they don't know who was opening up. They're like, I don't know who's opening up. They're like, you know what? Let's just like stick our ears to the to the window, or excuse me, to like to to to, to the door because they were they were doing a sound check, and they say to each other like, "I think it sounds like ACDC," and they go in, and who's opening up? But ACDC on the Power Age tour. Yes, and I mean that to me is just like you don't know who you're going to expect, and that just is a complete shock that you're seeing ACDC at the height of their powers with you know Bon Scott. I just heard that from Susan Messina, who was just on talking about uh -huh. that very thing. And she said, ACDC okay. and Cheap Trick, go. they were super tight. And she said something about it was the only time when both of them did an encore together. I can't remember oh, okay. what she said, but they had a great relationship. And yeah, imagine going to see that show, how much it would cost today to see right. those two exactly. guys. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but just, just the thought of not expecting to see one of the greatest bands ever, and there they are opening up, is uh, mind-blowing. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. Don't miss an episode of the Booked on Rock podcast. Subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast, or just go to the Booked on Rock website, bookedonrock.com, to find a full listing of podcast platforms where you can subscribe and follow. That's bookedonrock.com. Let's talk Richie Blackmore again. He loves the Fender Strat, and there was an interesting quote from the new book from bassist Rudy Sarzo of Quiet Riot fame, Ozzy Osbourne, White Snake. Yes. And he, he said the Fender Strat is the most unforgiving guitar you can play. If you don't know right. how to play, don't even try a Stratocaster. What do you think makes it so difficult to play? Uh, you know, I'm trying. Well, the Les Paul is definitely a uh, is a like fatter sound we know because of the humbucker pickups. The Strat, I mean, personally, you know, it's funny that he said that because I kind of find the Strat to be a little more like versatile as a as a guitar because I have a I have a cheap Strat and I also have a cheap um, Les Paul. And I mean, I definitely like both. I mean, the, the Les Paul, I think I, my, my hand, it, it's more comfortable on like the wide uh, neck of a Les Paul. But a Stratocaster, I don't know, it seems like you could get you do like a more wide variety of sounds out of a Strat, I think. I don't necessarily think it's that. To, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of like. I mean, it, it is a good point, but I, I just don't know. I mean, maybe if Rudy can, I maybe should have asked him for maybe some um, examples. And then what's interesting is he says that about a Strat. Meanwhile, we all know that Randy Rhodes played pretty much Les Pauls or guitars that were similar to Les Pauls, such as his Jackson Concord. We have to talk about Eric Clapton. Todd Rundgren talked to you about his guitar during the Cream era. Yes. Well, what happened was um, Todd Rundgren in the 70s was in uh, Woodstock, I believe. Uh, there was a uh, studio I think he used to use up there. And he was hanging out, I think, with the band called The Band. And uh, one of them or someone associated with the band had what's called the full, less, uh, excuse me, the full Gibson SG, which was 
the Gibson SG Eric Clapton used back with the cream. And uh, at that point, though, it was totally neglected and it was falling apart. And Todd Rundgren said the bridge had fallen off and they put some this piece of crap wooden thing there to kind of kind of like replicate a bridge. But he said it was not even playable. The guy who owned it was using it really just for slide work at that point. But he was able to buy it and he got it totally refurbished. And uh, you see in early 80s Utopia videos of them playing live. He he plays primarily that that uh, guitar, which has a very psychedelic type paint job on it. Then uh, then Todd Rundgren said about I think 10 or 20 years ago, he had to sell it because he came into some financial problems. So he had to sell it off. And uh, I forget how much he said he got he sold it for. But I'd imagine it's a pretty it was it was for a pretty penny because it definitely is a pretty famous guitar. That's cool. I love when guitarists name their guitars, like Stevie Ray Vaughan. Right. Was, yeah, was Frank it? and Strat. Frank and Strat and yeah. Stevie Ray's. What was Stevie Ray's favorite? You mentioned it in the book, too. He's got. Oh, he, I, well, I, I, I know, of course, B.B. King had uh, Lucille. Oh, yeah, Lucille. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> staying, staying with guitarists who came out of the 60s, how many of the guitarists you talk to will cite Leslie West as a huge inspiration? Uh, you know, I'm. I'm very happy you brought up Leslie West because about a month ago, I went through an intense mountain listening phase. And I got to tell you, Leslie West, I really should have listed as uh, as as one of my favorites. You know, with, the thing with Leslie West is his tone was just so amazing on those oh. early uh, th those early mountain albums. Yeah. The, the first three mountain albums. It, I, well, the, the first album was really just considered a uh, Leslie West solo album called Mountain. So that one and then the next two which were Nantucket Sleigh Ride, and the other one, the other title is slipping my my uh, mind right now. You know who brought me, but, um, brought me, or brought that band to my attention more so than any other? Howard Stern. Loved yes, Leslie. Yeah. Loved yeah, Leslie and loved his he, playing and loved Mountain. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, for anyone that's not familiar with Mountain, I wholeheartedly recommend their Greatest Hits album. It's fantastic. Yeah, great place and, to uh, start. We, I mean, it's really just his uh, his his sound was what was great. And uh, I interviewed Brad Talinsky for the book about Leslie West, because Leslie sadly passed away about one or two years ago. Yeah, and he got his uh, tone in the early seventies because he was playing through a PA. He was not playing through an actual guitar amp, because the story goes that he was going on tour and he was using Sun amps at the time, and Sun sent him a bunch of boxes. And he didn't open them up until the day before he was going to leave or the actual day he was going to leave. And he opens them up and they're not amps. They're actually PAs. So he had no choice but to take them on tour. It just so happened he found out that if you dialed it in a certain way, you could create natural distortion and fuzz. And it gave a huge, big, fat sound. Isn't that Coupled cool? with his, he, he used a Gibson uh, Les Paul Jr. Climbing from 1970. Of course, that, there you go, climbing. Yeah, that has yeah, Mississippi Queen, which everybody knows, but... That entire album, theme from an imaginary Western, speaking of yes. Cream, Pete Brown, Jack Bruce wrote that. Pete Brown was the guy who wrote a lot of the lyrics for Cream songs. Yes. Never in My Life, Silver Paper is so cool. Yes. For Yasger's Farm, uh, To My Friend is so cool. That's, that's Leslie being mellow, nice instrumental. Yeah. Uh, the Laird Sitting on a Rainbow, Boys in the Band. And then they followed yeah. with Nantucket Sleigh Ride, which yeah, had obviously the title track. Title track is probably my favorite song of theirs. Yeah. Don't Look Around. Yeah. They, yeah. Very, very underrated. And they were at Woodstock. A lot of people forget that. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Eddie was a buddy of Leslie's, too. That was, he was. Uh, yeah. yeah. I remember that. There, there's yeah. a clip of the 91 or 92 Foreign Lawful Carnal Knowledge Tour, or maybe the 93 tour where they were touring off the live album where Van Halen was in Long Island and Leslie got up Jones on Beach, I believe. Jones Beach, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jones Beach, yeah. That's on YouTube. Yeah, and he comes out and they do um, Mississippi Queen. And I think he even guested with them in 86 when Bachman Turner Overdrive was opening up the 5150 tour. I think uh, Leslie came out for an encore on that, too, cool. if I'm not mistaken. How about another underrated guitarist, Ronnie Montrose? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that first uh, that first Montrose album is one of those almost near perfect albums. Ted Templeman told Greg Renoff if, if they just if they only had a hit single off of that yeah. album, yeah. if only. That's true. We're That's talking true. with Greg Prado. He's the author of Iconic Guitar Gear, which is out now. Kurt Cobain included in the book. Now here's an interesting one: divisive, I would say. Right, the fans of '80s guitar, not fans of Kurt. 
But I would think his riffs, they're classic now. You can't yes, deny exactly. what he did. Yeah, what did Kim Thiel of Soundgarden and Nirvana's early drummer, Chad Channing, have to tell you about Kurt's sound? Well, Kim says primarily when he thinks of Nirvana's guitar, Tony thinks about either Fender Strats or Fender uh, Jaguars, which is, you know, that kind of thin sound. It's not a very fat sound, but uh, similar to the band Mud Honey, Nirvana used uh, fuzz boxes and things like that, like vintage big muff boxes. So they um, totally changed the sound of the guitar. And the thing, too, which I talk about in the book and I've said prior is... Uh, to me, there's always a misconception that you judge the talent of, you know, how fast someone could play or if they can do these wild acrobatic things. But for me, it's always the quality of the songwriting. And that's what, of course, made Eddie, uh, Eddie so great is, of course, he could solo fantastic, like with, you know, Eruption. But it's really the quality of the songs. I mean, he could write Jump, which, you know, that's a fantastic pop, complete masterpiece. When It's Love, you know, listen so to When I'm, It's Love, just the rhythm guitar playing on that. The solo yeah. is beautiful. Run so, it with the devil, too. Run it with the devil, yeah, you could say. Yeah, exactly. Or you can even say the song Ain't Talking About Love. That solo is very, very simple, but it fits the song perfect. He's, it's not like, oh, yeah, he, here's your guitar solo. And now he has to shred for 30 seconds. He just did a very simple, tasteful thing, which, of course, sticks in your head, and you'll remember that forever. Yeah, and he knew what was up, man. He listened to those old Cream records. Yeah. He knew. Play with feel. But yeah. it doesn't And matter. then also... Uh, and also talking about Kurt Cobain, I interviewed Chad Channing, who was the drummer on the Nirvana Bleach album. And he talked about how Kurt used a Mazrite uh, around the Bleach era, which not too many people think of with him. So he used that, which again, which is kind of funny. I mean, these guitars now are worth so much money. But the reason why Kurt was using Jaguars and Mazrites and things is because they were so cheap. At the time, you just go into a pawn shop and get whatever cheap, junky guitar there was. And that's also what I love so much about those grunge bands is... You went from everyone playing these overpriced, pointy guitars, which is kind of, it's really become this way again now that all these guitars are so overpriced and just, you know, it's ridiculous. Whereas you should just be able to go and just buy some cheap, crappy guitar and just be able to, you know, play whatever you want to play. And if you write a good song, it doesn't, you, know, you don't need a very high priced $10,000 uh, thing to write a timeless song, which is what Kurt Cobain did with, you know, playing all these junky secondhand guitars very punk he was very punk he, he even said when he heard punk guitarists he said well i could do that because when he was listening yeah. to bands like van halen and who else he was listening to at the time he actually what was in his first show it was a sammy hagar concert that was sammy a story. hagar yeah. Yeah, yeah sammy hagar and he also i think also aerosmith was one of his first shows as well yeah buck dharma of blue oyster cult is in your book often yes. overlooked often don't fear the reaper godzilla burning for you are classics what did he say about his setup from those days, the early days? Uh, he said that he never had that much. He would never had that big of a guitar collection because he really just wants guitars that he's going to play. He said he was never much for collecting, which I think he says he now, of course, looking back, totally uh, regrets because back in the 70s, you could buy all these guitars for next to nothing that now are worth thousands, thousands and thousands of dollars, you know, but um you know, it's funny with Blue Oyster Cult, not a lot of people talk about their first album, but their first album is one that I listen to the most. It has a very original sound, that album. It's, it is considered hard rock, but there's really only maybe one or two songs that have like that has a clear, uh, traditional, distorted guitar sound. The rest is it's, it's a weird guitar sound. It's almost like a clean, phased out sound. And it, it, it creates like a great kind of spooky vibe that fits the music really really well so if people aren't familiar with that first boys to cult album that came out in 1972 it's just self-titled i would recommend that's an album that people should check out cities on flame with rock and roll that that that's actually one of the songs that has distortion but there's a song called then came the last days of may which okay is very clean guitar solo which is great and then and then what's also very interesting about that album is that it has very odd song titles there's a song called she's as beautiful as a foot what a title. <laughs> what a title. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but again, that song, but musically it's great. And it also has a, a great uh, solo in it as well. So, yeah, and Buck Dharma and Eric Bloom, they're continuing. Yeah. Blue Eyes Both are called. Yeah, it's still continuing. To this day, the radio station yeah. I worked at for our 25th anniversary concert, Blue Eyes are called, was there. Very cool to see them up close. Classic yeah. band. 
The Edge. Can't go without talking about The Edge. Yes. I interviewed Matt Pinfield, who we all know from 120 Minutes back in the 90s, and he's also uh, still very successful with his own radio shows and everything. And I've interviewed him several times over the years. I got to tell you, uh, Matt Pinfield is one of the nicest people I've ever met. He always goes out of his way to be helpful and friendly, really, really salt of the earth type guy. He seems that way. He's and had... just, I mean, everything he's done for rock music over the years, he's just a great person. And he had really some is. health issues that he overcame. He did. He's had substance, substance abuse issues and he's gone to rehab and he's always been vocal about that and always tries to help out other people that are struggling and on Twitter, he's always, again, very honest, you know, saying, you know, this is my, you know, one year anniversary, my two year anniversary and giving very like, you know, uplifting messages. So that's he's cool. definitely one of the very good guys out there. Awesome voice too, great radio voice. Yes. Unique. Yes. Yeah. So exactly. what, what did he have to tell you about the edge and the gear he used, particularly with what Joshua Tree and Octoon Baby? He talked about that, I believe. Yeah, you know, see, that's the thing. I'll, I mean, I'll be honest with you. With with you two, I'm not the hugest. I mean, I, I definitely do like them, and I appreciate everything that they've done. And the thing with you two, I think that it's the guitarist, the Edge. I mean, he had a very original sound and style. That's what really gets me with the band. I don't really keep like, and, and it's their early stuff that I really like. But past say '84 is when I kind of tune out with them. But really, the early stuff, yeah, like what uh, Matt was saying, which I didn't know his digital delay that he used was the Korg SDD 2000, which he used from the early years up through the uh, Joshua tree. So that was, I guess, his main piece of gear. And th But then he also says that he upgraded eventually to the Korg SDD 3000. And he also used Vox AC 30 amps, which of course Brian May used. That's his most famous amp. And um, yeah, and then I, I just know from uh, early uh, YouTube videos, seeing them on uh, MTV, he'd play either a Stratocaster or a Gibson Explorer. It was like a uh, natural finish color uh, Gibson Explorer, and I believe a black Stratocaster. So what he play, but yeah, those were you know, and, and I mean, again, he's not using very expensive instruments or very expensive gear, but yet he came up with a very instantly identifiable sound. So again, that kind of goes back to what I'm saying that you don't have to spend a lot of money on this overpriced gear to uh, come up with something unique. Yeah, so you like the early albums. From you two yes. more so than the later ones, yeah. There, yes, there's some great yeah. stuff from those days. Unforgettable, the Unforgettable Fire, the the album, yeah. the title track is awesome. Yeah, some great stuff from back in the day. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get to some Ace stories. What did Ace have to say about the creation of his legendary smoking Gibson Les Paul Deluxe? And there's a picture you took of him too at a show, yes. right? <laughs> yep. Uh, the story goes that Kiss was on tour in Canada, probably one of their first tours, either the Hotter Than Hell tour or the first album tour. And uh, he bought some fireworks, include, including some uh, smoke bombs. And he took the back uh, off the guitar, you know, the little, uh, he, he unscrewed the little back, where, like the cavity is. And he put smoke bombs in there and he lit them. And it created a pretty cool effect. But by doing so, it kind of screwed up the wiring and everything inside. So it kind of fried the guitar. So he, I guess he and also his tech then worked on a system where it was just its own little uh, unit by itself so that it wouldn't screw up the wires anymore or anything like that. And then you see as Kiss got bigger than he you know, had professionally done um, less balls that he would push in the pickup and then a light would emanate from the pickup and then smoke would come out through that pickup. And also something that Ace talked about, which people kind of tend to overlook. In the 80s, he had a short-lived signature guitar from Washburn called the AF40, which was kind of like what I'm talking about. It was like a pointy guitar, which kind of reflected the time where everyone felt like they had to have some kind of pointy, odd-shaped guitar. And uh, he even says that, uh, he, his quote is, when I plugged it in compared to a Les Paul, it just didn't cut the mustard. So Kiss collectors probably enjoy trying to hunt down those uh, guitars nowadays. First time I ever realized Ace was just a badass guitarist was laying down the first album, Vinyl, on my brother's record player, and cold gin, the rift to mm. cold gin, man. That was like, yep. yeah, this dude can play. I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but um, one of my favorite solos of his is on Hotter Than Hell called Strange Ways. It's a song that not too many, I mean, of, of, of course, serious Kiss fans know that, but like if you're just a leisurely Kiss fan, you may not know it, but it's uh, the last song, Hotter Than Hell. It's like a very Hendrixy type solo. I'm going to give so, you mine that's, that might surprise some people, but I just like you said, the diehard 
hardcore Kiss fans will know this one. It's an album that the fans hate, but this solo is awesome. It's from Music from the Elder, mm-hmm. and it is the entire track is great. Two of them, really. One is Dark Light. Escape from the Island. Yes, you got it. Escape from the Island. <laughs> oh, man, that's good. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, that, you know, nobody heard it because the album bombed. But that right. song... What's, yeah, what's what's sad is they just uh, totally fumbled the ball with that. They People have said, too bad they, they didn't put out Creatures of the Night at that point instead of The Elder, because that's what Ace, going into The Elder, told Gene and Paul. He said, look, I want I, this next album has to be a heavy album, Return Back to Basics. We're losing fans. The last couple albums, it was Dynasty, which had uh, the disco song called I Was Made for Loving You. Then in 1980, it was, it was an album called Unmasked, which was very poppy. And he just told them, he said, look, we, we, we have to get serious again. And Gene and Paul thought doing The Elder was a good idea, which that album is, is awful. <laughs> yeah. And uh, do, pretty do, much do, made AC do, the band show there after. <laughs> yeah. I'm just a boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a world without heroes. A world without you seeing Gene cry at the end of the video. Yeah. No, Escape from the Island, such a cool instrumental. Actually, I would say the solo on Dark Light, that might be my favorite Ace solo, but then again, he's got some great solos. You can't, I, I yeah. don't know if you can put that above some of the classics like uh, Detroit Rock City or I think it would have his, his other she great. She is also a great solo as she, well. Yeah, she, oh, absolutely. Which yeah. then the, uh, the, the, the solo in She, Mike McCready later used to start his solo in the song called Alive by Pearl Jam. Yeah, that's yeah. he's a and huge then, Ace fan. Yeah. And then also Mike McCready says, besides Ace and She, uh, Robbie Krieger of The Doors, the solo five to one also starts very similarly. Okay. Well, it's the same. That's cool. Now we're (laughs) talking Mike McCready and the guitarist he loved, along with Ace, he loves UFO, Schenker, Michael Schenker. There's another one that's a great guitarist. Do you ever interview him? I've interviewed him many, many times. Yes, okay. I have. Yeah, I actually did a book uh, called German Metal Machine Scorpions in the 70s. What book haven't you and written, man? The- You're prolific. Yeah. <laughs> prolific. Yeah, that's cool. He's He seems like a nice guy, very quiet. He's um kind of a, he's kind of unpredictable, and uh, he definitely speaks his mind. It can get a little uncomfortable when he's really bad-mouthing his brother. Yeah, yeah, that they don't get along. Yeah, huh? he... Uh, yeah, he like he, something went down between him and also Rudolph from the band the, uh, the Scorpions, which uh, he pretty much wants nothing to do with him. Is from what I, from me speaking to him and also the other interviews, I don't know, it was a bad business thing that went down or uh, something else. He yeah. just wants to keep his distance, which is kind of sad. Hey, I mentioned that shot of Ace that you took, but you got great photos from Bill O'Leary too. He's yes, he's a great, great photographer. Um, I was lucky enough; he was. Kind enough to give me great photos of uh, Eddie from 1980, also of uh, Randy Rhodes uh, and also Jeff Beck and a bunch of other guitarists. Also, really cool pic. It's a cool, clear photo of Todd Rundgren playing the Eric Clapton, the full Gibson SG as well. Yeah, he's got one of Andy Summers of the Police, which is really cool. Close up shot of yes. Andy Summers. And there's a guy. Yeah. There's a sound I like more and more as time goes on. What a distinct tone he has. Exactly. On those police yep. records. I get an image of a razor thin sheet of metal, like super sharp, shiny, crystal clear. Right. What can you talk about his guitars? The first he bought from a kid in LA, right? It was a couple hundred bucks. Yes. Yes. He taught he said he bought it from a kid in LA and he said he took it home and he realized that he ripped the kid off. So he actually got back in contact with the kid and he said, Look, are you sure you know you sure you don't want this back? And the kid's like, nah, I'll take it. I don't want it. And he talks about with the Telecaster, whoever owned it before, did all these like strange things to it, similar to what Eddie did, where he um, put all these like aftermarket uh, add-ons to it. One thing, I don't know what was part, it, it's listed more in the, in the book, I kind of target here, but he talks about something was run on a battery in his guitar, and there's also another switch added. I think it was maybe a phase switch or something. And if you look at the picture of it in the book you can you can clearly see what he's talking about with the little switch that shot that bill o'leary took of him yes yes you can see there's like a little face switch and right now i'm looking at it. it's a black and white oh okay i see what it is it's a switch and also was added was it was like another either volume knob or some kind of tone control knob you see it, it has three knobs i think 
trying to and find it. He has it. a switch. He has a switch between two knobs. Oh, then yeah, here it is. Yes. Yeah, so, oh yeah, you're right. And then also, of course, a, a humbucker was added to that Telecaster as well. I actually, yeah. I got to see Sammy in the circle, Sammy Hagar in the circle, and George Thurgood opened up. George Thurgood's a badass guitarist. He, yeah, he could play the I slide. Agree. He could play the slide really good. That was a fun show. Yeah. Sammy's a good guitarist too, man. You got to give him credit. He can. He is. He he can. I agree. He can play. Yep. The Gibson double neck guitar synonymous with two guys, Jimmy Page and Don Felder. Jimmy on Stairway yes. to Heaven, Don on Hotel California. Don shared with you some info on his Gibson 1275 double neck and where it is these days. Yeah, he uh, donated it to, they, they, they had the, um, Metro, the Metropolitan Museum of Art called, uh, Play, called Play It Loud, which I don't think they have it anymore, but at the time they had all the classic guitars they had. Frankenstrat, they had some, some of Jimi Hendrix's guitars, they had Jimmy Page's Double Neck and also Les Paul, Eric Clapton's Blackie, and they had the uh, Don Felder Double Neck as well, which he uh, used on uh, Hotel California. It was the EDS-1275 is the Gibson Double Neck guitar that he used, which uh, you can see in the Hotel California video. I love that story about how he wrote the opening to Hotel California, just hanging out on the beach there. He had a house on the beach. Yes. I think his, his little daughter was outside playing and he was just playing, yes. you know, he's just messing around on his guitar there. And he always had a recorder by and put it down on tape, yep. send it to Henley. And there you go. Next thing you know, you got a, a friggin' classic, a timeless oh, yeah. classic, right? This is interesting. <clears throat> you talked to both John Fursante and Josh Klinghoffer of the Red Hot Chili yes. Peppers. And you got Josh who replaced Fursante and I thought Josh did a great job on the two Chili Peppers albums that he was on. 2011's I'm With You, 2016's The Getaway, which I love. And mm. he did justice to the band's sound, which Frusante had a big part in. So what did you get out of those two interviews? Did you pick up on any similarities in their approach to getting that sound? Was there anything you picked up on? Well, yeah, I mean, I think they have a similar sound because Josh, uh, he, he was originally touring with the Chili Peppers when John was still in the band. So he was pretty much just like his, uh, you could Protégé. say, backup guitarist. Yeah, yeah. So, but then also uh, Josh talks about in the, in, in the book that he started playing a Strat and like Fenders because of John Frusciante to get to get his type of sound that fits well with the Peppers. And he even says that, um, uh, Josh says that he, Bought, I believe, a Gibson Firebird at one point, thinking he'd be able to try to work it into the Chili Peppers sound. And he said, no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't do it because Chili Peppers sound is pretty much just the Strat. That's the guitar sound that you expect from that band. Kirk Hammett of Metallica talked to you about the guitar he used on 1983's "Kill 'Em All," a simple amp yes. effect setup. Yeah, it was very, very straight ahead. It was just a um, Flying V, Gibson Flying V that. I don't think he talked about it in my interview, but I know I've read in the past that he worked a summer in Burger King, I believe, just flipping burgers just to save up uh, the uh, precise cost of what a of what a Gibson Flying V would cost. And he uh, got that, and then he pretty much quit right afterwards, I think, after he was able to purchase that. But um, he also talks about how uh, when they were recording the song, uh, I think it was the song uh, Metal Militia, he talks about how they have a uh, tube screamer and that there's a tritone. He says, I'll read it to you. He says, uh, I know that metal militia starts off with a tritone right before the rest of the band kicks in. I remember I couldn't have the tube screamer on for the tritones because it would feed back in the hole where those tritones would go. So I remember Lars sitting there with a tube screamer in his hand. And I asked him to turn the tube screamer on after the tritones so I could just start ripping immediately. I wouldn't have to worry about turning on the tube screamer with my foot. That's actually Lars turning on the tube screamer and on that on that solo for a metal militia. That's old school Metallica right there. Kill them all. It was a it was a 1979 Flying V was what he used. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. If you're a publisher or author of a book on rock and you want to be on the Booked on Rock podcast, contact us through our website, bookedonrock.com. Or send an email to the Booked on Rock Podcast at gmail.com. Hendrix, the Fender Stratocaster, quotes from quite a few guitarists regarding Jimmy and how much they loved hearing him play that over anything else he played. And his mastery of effects, Adrian Ballou, Bruce Kulick of Kiss, they shared their thoughts on his brilliance there. 
Yes. What it is is uh, for that. I just recently in 2020 did a book called Avatar of the Electric Guitar, The Genius of Jimi Hendrix, for which I interviewed uh, Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, uh, Kirk Hammett, many, many uh, guitarists. So I was able to really just take some uh, juicy quotes from that and put it into this. But uh, yeah, I mean, um, the thing with Jimi Hendrix, and I've said this before, Jimi Hendrix and also uh, all the greats, I even say it in the, I believe it's in the uh, uh, forward to the book of the uh, book we're talking about called uh, Iconic Guitar Gear. I talk about how um, you could have given Jimi Hendrix, Eddie Van Halen, all the greats, like any, you can give them like a cheap piece of crap guitar and they're going to make it sound like them because I have the belief that it was, it was all in their hands and they were able to have their personality come out through their fingers and through the strings and everything. So, you know, of course, while you associate a Fender Stratocaster with Jimi Hendrix, you could have given him just about any guitar, and I think he would have sounded like him. Because, I mean, if you even uh, watch some of the, like, the Isle of Wight Festival, which was filmed in 1970, I think less than a month before he died, Jimi Hendrix, he's playing a Gibson Flying V, and he's pretty mu it pretty much sounds like Jimi Hendrix. It's not like that it sounds that much different than when you hear him in 67 or 68. So that just kind of proves my point that you could have handed him any, any old guitar. He would have made it sound like Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, and then the reverse would be there was a guy, and I always forget who it was, but there was a guy who said he he was with Brian May and he was around all of his gear and his setup, played with his guitar, and he couldn't sound like Brian May. I think it may have been Steve Vai. Steve Vai said in 1980 when he was in Frank Zappa's band, he just happened to bump into Brian May, I think somewhere, like a, 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 maybe like this, not the Starwood, but the Whiskey or one of those places, and he went up to him and introduced himself, said, hi, my name's Steve Vai. I'm in Frank Zappa's band. I'm a huge fan of your guitar playing. And Brian May was kind enough to introduce, I mean, to invite Steve Vai to Queen's soundcheck that afternoon at the Forum, I believe, in L.A. And uh, he played in Brian May, let Steve Vai play through his guitar. And he said he couldn't sound like Brian May. Even while Brian May picks it up and it sounds just like Brian May. Yeah, that's so wild. That's cool. actually Actually, in this book, I interviewed Paul Crook, who people may know as the guitarist in uh, Meatloaf's band, and he was also in the We Will Rock You musical. He was he played all Brian May's guitar parts in the first go-round of that, and he says he's played um, the Red Special, which is what uh, was what Brian May's guitar is called. He's played the actual Red Special many times over the years, and Brian May told him that the secret, how he does vibrato, is not to pull a string up. It's like he says, picture that he's put that there's springs underneath the string and the fret and you're just pushing it directly down. You're not bending up. You're just pushing directly down. That's how he's doing vibrato. That's like a mad scientist. That's yeah. somebody that, that's somebody who's playing a lot of guitar before he gets to that point where he picks up on that. Yeah. How about Tony Iommi as far as those first two albums with Ronnie James Dio? Because that's interesting because he used a different guitar the gibson sg is what he used during the sabbath days with ozzy and that of course right. helped him create heavy metal but he transitions to a custom-made sg in the late 70s and there's a guy by the name of john birch who had a lot to do with that john birch. yeah those those heaven and hell 1980 mob rules 1981 great albums what did he tell you about that yeah, he said that uh well one thing he said just kind of interesting is um not so much the uh, not, not so much the guitars, but he. I'm um, reading this here. He said uh, he wanted to. The way I'm just reading this quick with the amps. I uh, Tony Iommi always used a uh, treble booster, and uh, when they when they when they made his amps, whoever always oh, a gentleman by the name of John Doc Stillwell. He used to build he used to build Richie Blackmore's amps. Um. Tony Iommi told him, he said, you know, where is this treble booster? And he said, oh, no, you don't need that. I, I, I didn't include it. And he said that uh, that really pissed him off because that was how he got his sound was through using a treble booster. So he said that his quote is, I was really not happy about that, is what he's saying. Mm. <laughs> he says that the guy just, he, he said, he, he thrown it away and I didn't and I didn't know. He said, you don't need that. You just go straight into the amp, which is what I did. So he pretty much had no choice to do that. And what, what but, do you I think mean, of those first two albums with, with Ronnie, Ronnie James? Oh, Steele? I absolutely love them. I, I I put them on par with the with those classic Ozzy Sabbath albums. I love those first yeah. two uh, Dio albums. With, with that's uh, the sound of Sabbath being um, reborn because the previous two albums stunk. 
the albums is I never say die and also technical ecstasy. Yeah. It was not focused and it was just uh, the sound of a band going through the motions and just kind of grasping at straws, not, not, not being very focused. Similar to, you could say, Kiss with Dynasty and also Unmasked and also The Elder, just band that doesn't sound very inspired or focused or has any real kind of drive. Yeah, the wheels were coming off at that point. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and Ronnie James Dio, his voice is just so different than Ozzy's, and yet it worked. Yeah, and it's just the quality of the riffs and everything. Tony Iommi was definitely uh, refocused and re-inspired, you can tell. We talked about Kim Thiel being influenced by Tony Iommi, Kim Thiel of Soundgarden, and he had a great quote about playing the guitar. A lot of the younger guitars feel like you have to play a guitar that's difficult to play to be taken seriously. And he says, it's all about just finding the guitar that's easiest for you to play. That's all that matters. Right. Yeah, it's true. I, th- there was, uh, I remember a guitarist who I qu- like quite a lot, uh, the guitarist Jakey e. Lee, once uh, said something. He was back in like the late 80s. He said uh, he liked his Charvel guitar because he likes the sound of when he's fighting the guitar rather than just doing a perfectly articulated run on the guitar. But then speaking to Kim Thiel from Soundgarden for this book, Iconic Guitar Gear, he said the complete opposite. He says, I, I, I don't like to fight the guitar. I like it to be very easy to play. So that's why he was, that, that's what attracted him to the Guild S100 Deluxe. That, that, that's his uh, trademark guitar, the white guitar that he used on all of Soundgarden's classic albums. Yeah, Angus picked a specific guitar because it was most comfortable because he's just a little guy. He uh, picked a guitar. The, he's the SG guy, right? He loves the right, SG. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> he's such a little guy. If I was a guitarist, he'd be like falling forward. Boom. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> little dude. Bruce Kulick, right. I would say, is underrated. We should give him some love, too, because I don't think there was a better guy for Kiss in the 80s. Came along at the right time. And he's got some really cool stuff, like his solo on Reason to Live from 1987's yes. Crazy, crazy nights, or no? The yes, song crazy is nights. crazy, crazy nights. The yeah, album the song is, is crazy, crazy nights. The album is oh, crazy man. nights. But yeah, yeah, his solo on there and his work on Ninety One's Revenge, so good. He talks about the multi swirl ESP guitar and the yellow banana ESP, a name yes. he actually came up with during the Crazy Night sessions, right? So ESP is out of Japan, but Bruce told you there was a New York connection there. Yeah, what it was, was a lot of the guitarists at that time were using Kramer guitars because, of, of course, uh, Eddie was using Kramer guitars. So people started going to Kramer and they were, I, uh, I guess they were, I, I didn't think they were based in New York, but somehow people were getting in contact with Kramer. And it turns out that Kramer was sourcing all their parts from a Japanese company called ESP. So I remember it was actually George Lynch then at, right, right around the same time thought to himself, well, why the hell am I dealing with Kramer? I should just go right directly to the source. And that's how then uh, George Lynch starts using ESP, Bruce Kulick starts using ESP, Kirk Hammett starts using ESP, and that's how ESP becomes such a hugely popular uh, guitar brand. Yeah, ESPs, they've been around for quite a while. 19, well, actually, no, 75? Okay, yeah, 75. I yeah, thought... yeah, possibly from the 70s, but I, I know here in like America, it wasn't until George Lynch and also Bruce Kulick started using them. And also Vernon Reed used uh, the multi-swirl, the Cult of Personality video, he's using that. Alex Lifeson of Rush, he shared his memories regarding the gear he used during your favorite era of Rush, the early 80s. Yeah, permanent waves and also moving pictures. He. It was kind of just a brief little like sentence long th- sentence long things, but it was like yeah, pretty cool to hear. Something that people don't really uh, know or remember is in the late seventies, early eighties, he used a short lived guitar synthesizer. He used a nineteen seventy seven Roland GR five hundred A for the live performance of Hemispheres, the uh, twenty minute long uh, first song on Hemispheres. He uh, he used that, and I was uh, lucky enough through the great photographer Bill O'Leary. He gave me about five or six photos of uh, Alex Lifeson from this era, and he was able to get an actual picture of him playing the guitar synthesizer, which is not something you see Alex Lifeson play very much. I think he only used that maybe on two or three tours at the time, I would think, and then he just kind of put it away in the closet, and that was it. Stevie Ray Vaughan, I got to ask, we got to go back to him again because there's a really, really cool story that you got from his keyboardist, Reese Winans. Reese was the keyboardist on... Definitely the last album, In Step, from 89. I think he may have been on 
sold us family style. Family style, yeah. He, but he had a great story about Stevie Ray and how basically the more amps the better. And also he yes. would play a song over and over until it was right. Yeah, right. He, he shared some cool stories about in the studio with Stevie Ray. He also he said that he would play very very loud. He said um, recording in step. He had fifteen different amps set up in the room. It was so loud in there, but he got this unbelievable guitar sound. Yeah, and he says the song "The House Is Rocking," which he which he think is it's a very simple song, but he said that uh, he must have played that song twenty times. Yeah, because I guess he was a perfectionist with getting things just right. There was a story about when he recorded. There's a song on in step. I believe it's the last track. And it's a real slow, beautiful piece. Riviera Paradise? Yeah, I think it was Riviera Paradise where the producer just rolled tape, sat back, and was just like, holy shit, this guy's good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just yeah, he like, definitely was. Just in a zone, you know? Yeah. What are your top five all-time guitar solos? Okay. Well, for the first one I had, I couldn't decide on, it was either between Jimi Hendrix's Machine Gun or Voodoo Child. Can't really put my finger on it. I mean, Machine Gun is such a long solo, but it has that fantastic thing in the middle where he holds that one note and it's feeding back for so long. Yes. That's jam band That's Jimmy right there. That's jamming. Yeah, it's absolutely great. And again, like I'm usually not a big fan of when bands jam for like 20 minutes. I kind of, it just kind of bores me. But that Machine Gun solo really just grabs you by the throat, totally commands your attention. That's great. But then also, of course, Voodoo Child, you think that came out 1968 and there was no one doing anything even remotely like that at that point with all the feedback and everything so it's kind of hard for me to pick one but you could say either machine gun or voodoo child as, as your number, number one. as your number one or five yeah. okay i'll go with, go with one yeah I'll, I'll i'll start at the top and go back and then number two i went with the mean street intro there you go yes because i just love that rhythmic percussive tapping thing is fantastic and uh Eddie Van Halen, uh, I guess, yeah, I've, I've like read this. There's, there's a famous meme now that says like, uh, I forget the exact thing, but it's like, you know, the earth is whatever, like, you know, however many, you know, thousands of years old. And just think you and I were lucky enough to live in during the same time as uh, Eddie Van Halen. I saw that. So, yeah. Yeah. So there's actually truth to that. So at least I could say I, I actually saw Eddie Van Halen live. You did, yeah. and and before you go to number three, you talked with Wolfie, his son Wolfie. You had an interview with him. Yes, yeah, couldn't have been a nicer guy, Wolfie. Yeah, isn't it? He's such right. a he's soft spoken, sweetheart of a guy. Yeah. But you mess with him on social media, look out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> look yeah, out. It, it's actually what, what what I what I wanted to mention to him during the interview because I interviewed him for the uh, website Song Facts. I was just going to tell him, like, not even part of the interview. I was going to say, like, you know. You shouldn't let idiots bother you this much with social media. I mean, there's always been these assholes out there that just say stupid shit, and they're just saying it just to kind of like you know get you pissed off. But we didn't really we didn't really get that far with the interview. Maybe like I ran out of time. Well, you know, he's but, been told that, and his response has always been, "Guys, you don't get it. It doesn't bother me. I'm having fun with it." That's what uh, he says. Yeah, there you go. He's having. Oh, there you he go. had to find some way because he says it did bother him for a long, long time, and he had to find some way to deal with it. Because it's like a necessary, it's necessary for him to be on social media. It's just what you have to do. So he goes on there right. and he appreciates the, the support and the positive comments. The ones who will make stupid comments, he just calls them out. Hey, right. to each his own, you know, I, I'm with you. Yeah. I just ignore You just ignore it, move on. But, he, but some of them are really funny. His comebacks are really good. Right, right. But yeah, <laughs> anyway, yeah, you talked right. to Wolfie. So, all right, let's move on to... Number three, the third three, greatest solo of all time is? Yes. I went with We Will Rock You by Queen. Is that say solo that you could sing the whole solo and uh, it's a very lyrical? Yeah. I, again, I mentioned before uh, Jim Martin from the band Faith No More, who I think is very underrated. I mentioned the song Epic. That's also a solo that you could sing along to. It's maybe similar to also We Will Rock You, but of course, We Will Rock You is much better known. But uh, Brian May to me is uh, in a league all his own. And then uh, number four is a song I talked about a bit before, the song called Quadrant Four, starring Tommy Boland with Billy Cobham. Tommy Boland's use of uh, Echoplex, which then, of course, later Van Halen used. Um, in fact, in Van Halen's club days, they, they covered a Tommy Boland song. I forget. I think the song called The Grind, which was from the album Teaser. I think Van Halen used to cover it. So it's, it's, it's on YouTube. 
can you can track it down. But yeah, Quadrant Four, that solo is just absolutely phenomenal, just especially for 1973. Number five, I figured I had to go with Ace, so either Strange Ways or Rocket Ride. Rocket Ride, yeah, that's off so, of the live too. That's one of the four yeah, studio tracks. That's on, the, that's on the fourth side, which is the studio uh, side of 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 a live for you. Yeah, that's a great solo, and also Strange Ways is like I said, is I have kind of a Hendrixy type solo. And it's a, a fantastic solo. And if you ask me again in five minutes, I could probably tell you 15 other solos that, that I, I, I talked before about Tattooed Love Boys by The Pretenders. That's also, that would be my number six solo. Or who, maybe it would even switch with, with Strange Ways. I don't know, because that one's a great one as well. I also loved um, The Sales of Sharon by Uli John Roth. Old school Scorps. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, you can just you can keep going on. And on. I mean, of course, everyone says uh, eruption, but I figured I should go with Mean Street just to try something a little different. And besides Mean Street, honestly, that's like still I find myself listening to that a lot more now because I've heard eruption so much. And like we said before, I'm always attracted. I'm so much more attra- I'm so much more impressed with the rhythm and riff of like Out of Love again than I am with some very fast Speed Demon solo that he did. You know, light up the sky. Exactly. Hell yeah. We'll finish with Eddie, but. Before we get to Eddie, let's talk about Stevie Vai, because I'm a huge fan of yes. his work with David Lee. Yes. And you talked about Eat Him and Smile, how great that album is. And he talked about five of his best known axes. And I want to zero in on his time with Dave. He told you that when he joined Roth's band, he had companies that were reaching out to him to help design the perfect guitar. And then he sent the right. specs out. Every time he got them back, they were basically models that they already made with just a little change here and there, nothing major. Right. All of them except for Ibanez. Ibanez, this is the one that goes way back to the late 19th century, Ibanez. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was mm-hmm. Steve who put the name on the map with the launch of the now classic J-E-M, right? Gem Signature Solid yeah. Body Guitar. So he told you it's perfectly suited to him. Yes. Although, you know, I, I got to tell you something. Um, Steve Vai is also one of my favorite guitarists. I really probably should have included him. He, you, know, I, you know, it's funny. If if I did this interview back in the late 80s, Steve Vai would have probably been the number one guitarist because wow. I was a Steve Vai fanatic from, like, you know, Eat Him and Smile and all that. But my my favorite era of Steve Vai is 1980 when he starts with Frank Zappa through Eat Him and Smile. And the guitar he's using with Frank Zappa is a Fender Strat. And then with Alcatraz and maybe even Flexible and definitely Eat Him and Smile. He's using the Green Meanie Charvel Strat. And um, that to me is my favorite Steve Vai guitar sound and also playing. I know he's become, uh, the guitar that he's become most synonymous with is the uh, Ibanez Gem, which he, which he created. But I just like his playing a lot more with the Charvel. Again, that goes maybe back to he's fighting a little bit more and it's just, a little more of like a tension or just something more. I just liked, I just like his sound more too. It seems like when he starts playing the Ibanez gem, it's a little too pristine and clean sounding kind of, again, I'm sure there's thousands of Steve Vai fans that are going to say, no, you know, you're totally wrong, but that is, this is just my personal opinion that I just prefer his guitar sound on Alcatraz, disturbing the peace, flexible, and also eat him and smile where he's using the green meanie. So that's just my, Two cents if I could just put that in there. Shout yeah, out, but the, shout out, by the way, to Gary Shea, the bassist for Alcatraz from mm-hmm. my hometown here, Southington, Connecticut. Literally lived, grew up right down the street from me here. Nice. Yeah, just kind of found that out through his website. That he was from Connecticut and then looked it up and said Southington, Connecticut. I was like, get the hell out of here. So I reached out to him on yeah. Facebook. And anyway, yeah. It so, the thing, yeah, because the thing, too, which uh, Steve talks about in the book, uh, Iconic Guitar Gear, he talks about the Ibanez Universe 7, which when it first came out in 1990, it uh, was kind of a gimmick. It, you know, sold probably like, OK, but wasn't that great. And it, it and then by the early 90s, it had dipped solo in uh, sales that Ibanez reached out to Steve Vai saying, I think we should just stop, uh, you know, putting this out there because it's not it's selling a handful of copies per year. And Steve Weiss said, no, absolutely not. You got to trust me. This will find an audience. You just got to keep it out there. So Ibanez said, all right, fine. They kept it out there. And then in 1994, 1995, Love Them or Hate Them, the band Korn came out. And they then, re- then they introduced the whole detuned seven-string guitar thing, which then now every single new metal band has abused that <laughs> 
since then, especially in the late 90s, early uh, 2000s. Passion and Warfare. That's a good album from Stevie. That's right after. That is a good album. That's probably the last album of his that I really studied and really liked. But again, at that point, the guitar sound is a little too clean and pristine for me. I, I liked more the Edom and Smile tone or the flexible tone. I like the Attitude song. That's that's my Steve Vai. Yeah. The Attitude song. The Attitude song. Yeah. Yep. We're going to put Shy that. Shy Boy. Way. Shy Boy. Shy Boy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's finish with Eddie. Eddie Van Halen. What a great that's story it. that you get from Brad Talensky, who is the co-author of the excellent book Eruption, Conversations with Eddie Van Halen. And the listeners can head to the Van Halen News Desk, get a detailed explanation behind what Brad feels maybe what led to Eddie creating the now iconic red, black, and white Frankenstrat design. Thank you for sharing your article with the VHND from originally All Music. But can you give us the abbreviated version, basically, of Brad's theory? There are four, four things that he points to, right? Yeah there's, uh, yeah, there's a few things that stick in my mind that he said. Uh, one thing is um, there's an artist. His name is Mont- Mondrian. I think it's Piet Mondrian or P.A. Mondrian. I'm not sure how you spell it. But there was a style of painting called the Distill style, which is spelled D-E. That's the first word. Second word is spelled S-T-I-G-L. And it's um, colors that have like hard angles. In fact, what's funny, we talked earlier about uh, Adrian Ballou, and he had a uh, Fender Jaguar in the early 80s that he used when he played with King Crimson. And he, he, he told me in an interview that he used the Distill paintings as a inspiration for those guitar designs as well. But yeah, if you look at the Distill paintings, you see a little bit of the lines that Eddie Van Halen would use later with uh, Frankenstrat. But then also there was a, a guitarist, there was a, a punk guitarist called the Dills. Uh, and the guitarist's name was Chip Kinman. And he had a white Les Paul, and he had black electrical tape that looked very much like the um, design of Frankenstrat. And uh, there's some talk um, that uh, a few members of Van Halen went to see the Dills around that time, that they were that they were kind of closet punk fans, Van Halen was. And they played on but the West they, Coast. That Yes. The Dills, yeah. Yeah, yeah West Coast. Yeah, and that uh, he may have been inspired by that. And then also mixed in with... Um, when uh, the Van Halen family first moved to California, hot rods were very popular at that point, and a lot of teenagers were probably working on their uh, cars outside in their front uh, lawn. So uh, Brett Talinsky's theory is that you could also say like hot rod and also pinstriping and things like that also come into play as well. You could say that's part of it. And then, uh, and, and then also you could say part of it is just Eddie Van Halen not having that much money at the time. I mean, what, what, what could he do to spruce up his guitar if he doesn't have that much money? You could just uh, buy some paint, paint it, and you could just put some electrical tape on it to make it look different than the guitars that Jimmy Page or Michael Shanker or Jeff Beck were playing, you know? Yeah, it's, just, it's so cool how so many different things come into play. And it's not, it's not like any of those he was looking at them saying, I'm going to make a guitar based on that. But it's like Brad says, they're just things that came and went throughout his life that had an impact on him or that he had seen at some point that he just remembered either subconsciously or consciously, whatever it is. But that guitar, yeah. I mean, that is that might be the most iconic guitar in terms yeah. of once yeah, you see say, it, in, you know. In fact, in fact, I would say it's so iconic that I put it on the cover of the book, Iconic Guitar Gear. Yeah, it's on the cover of Iconic Guitar Gear. It's a guitarist dream, but it's also a fascinating look at these amazing musicians for those who don't play, but just are so moved by what they hear from these legendary guitarists. And listen, I, we could have named so many of these guitarists during this interview, but we would be here forever. So, so if you're listening to this saying, why didn't you mention this guy? Why didn't you mention him? Well, there's over, like we said, around 275 guitarists that you talk to and bass players too, which is cool. Yeah, and bass players so, too, yeah. Yeah, they, they're all in there. So we, we, we should mention, I mean, listen, Zach Wild, God, you have Glenn Tipton in there. You have Slash, Kenny Wayne Shepard. You did talk to Billy Sheehan. You got Michael Schenker, Satch, Joe Satriani's in there. Uh, Randy Rhodes, of course. Uh, Brad Talinsky talked to you about him. Vernon Reed, boy, the list with Johnny Ramone. Jimmy Page, you got in there, of course. You got to have Jimmy Page. Steve Morse, who just retired, right, from Deep Purple. Yes. Did you see that? Yeah, or or, he, or he's, he's at least taking a break. I know he right. he he left Deep Purple. 
He's tending his uh, wife, who I think is in uh, ill health, sadly. Really cool thing for him to do, though. Yeah, he's just going to step down. He was hoping to get, get back on the road, but she's not doing well, so he wants to make sure he's taking care of her. Tom Morello, you got in there. You have Roger McGuinn. Is go- oh, Ingve Malmsteen, George Lynch, Nils Lofgren, Lennon, which is interesting, right? You got him covered yes. in there. Richie Kotzen, Eric Johnson, oh, mm-hmm. Cliffs of Dover. Yep. Love it. Steve Howe, Bumblefoot, Steve Hackett, Tracy Guns, Scott Gorham, you did mention him, Paul Gilbert, Lita Ford, yep. Richie Faulkner, Rick Emmett of Triumph, oh, Dean and Robert DeLeo of the Stone Temple Pilots, that's very cool, Dimebag Daryl, nice, as told by Rex Brown, Billy Corgan, Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Les Claypool, Vivian Campbell from Def Leppard, too, uh, oh, Jason Becker, man, yep. Jason Becker. What an awesome guy, man. He is still still going. Uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. Yeah, absolutely. Very absolutely. Very Red Beach is another. Martin Barr, Randy Bachman, Jeff Ament. So there you go. That's just I'm just running through some of the ones that I would I would have asked you about because I love, but you know, we can't get them all. The book is on Amazon and they can get it there. Uh, where can people find you on social media? Anything else you want to get out there for people to check out where they can find you? Yeah, I was going to say with this book, uh, Iconic Guitar Gear, it's available as a paperback, also a hardcover, and also an audio book, uh, which is narrated by me, and also as a Kindle as well. So it's four different editions. You could uh, choose which one you like the most, and it's available on Amazon. And uh, yeah, you're always welcome to um, check out all my other books on Amazon, just to search for Greg Prado. And on Twitter, you could uh, find me. I'm at uh, twitter.com slash Greg Prado Writer. I'm always posting... Um, my latest articles. In fact, I just posted, I wrote for the Heavy Consequence site, the 35th anniversary of Def Leppard's Hysteria was today on August 3rd. I saw that today. Yep. I'm going to read that. Yep. So I I did an interview with Joe Elliott and also Phil Collin. It's a video interview as well. So you can see me doing a video interview with both of them. Nice. People should go to the Van Halen News Desk, vhnd.com, because your article is going to be up there. And I do have a link there. So if you want to find out more on Greg Prado, including his latest books, articles, links to social media pages, I got a link right there so people can go. It's very easy to do it that way. So So that's it, man. All right, Greg. Great. Until next time. Yes. Thank you, Rock, for having me. It's always great speaking with you. Thanks, as always, for listening. I'm Eric Senich. Join me again next time for another brand new episode of Booked on Rock. That's it. It's in the books.